Welcome to everyone tuning in tonight to the first edition of Ask a Professor. My name is Josh Boyd. I'm Associate Professor and Director of Undergraduate Studies for the Brian Lamb School of Communication here at Purdue. And I'll be leading the discussion tonight as we hear from members of the community with questions for our Purdue professors. Joining us tonight are my colleagues from the Lamb School who will now introduce themselves. Jane? Hi, I'm Jane Natt. I'm an Associate Professor in the Lamb School. I spent uh, 17 years with the Associated Press as a reporter and editor and went back to graduate school and I've been here at the Brian Lamb School for 17 years. I like 17, I guess. All right. John? I'm John Ellerbach and I spent the last five years al alone basically as a hermit on the mountain in North Carolina as a writer. Found that I got a little bit lonely. I'm glad to be back in education. I started out as a reporter but didn't make any money so I sold out and went into public relations. So a little bit of my background is that I got my PhD at Indiana University. Ooh. I know, and then moved a couple hours north, and this is my 20th year here at Purdue. So I teach one of our required classes in the um, Lamb School that's writing intensive. Jane and I talk a lot about writing, mm -hmm. and uh, I enjoy spending time with undergraduates. So. Let's start with our first question. What is something that your students do that drives you nuts? Something our students do that drives us nuts. Jane, what do you think? Super easy. Uh, cell phones. I don't like them. I don't want them on in my class. I tell you I don't want them on in my class. You're looking at them. But the thing that really gets to me is when I come before class and everybody's on their cell phone and I get into class and I'm like, you were just next to that person. What's that person's name? Hmm. I don't know because they're on their cell phones. Put your phone in your pocket. Say hi to somebody. Could be your new best friend. You don't know. <laughs> John, how about you? But you know how I handle that. If, if a student's talking on the cell phone, I get to talk to whomever. I've had some wonderful conversations with uh, parents, mm -hmm. and I tell them a few things that are interesting about the student. Uh, other things that make me crazy are when students actually come prepared to class, because then I have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. I, cell phones don't bother me that much. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just oblivious. That's quite Maybe possible. Maybe you're younger. Uh, I think the thing that makes me crazy is just students not following directions. And just today I was talking about an assignment that I do regularly and I always change the, um, the assignment a little bit and there, there are parameters. Students have to choose uh, a topic from a certain time period and I always get questions. My topic is not actually in the time period. Is it okay if I do it anyway? No, it's not. Just here it is. There it is. Go for it. You've got plenty of options. Excuse me, I've got to take a call. Do you guys mind? Okay, so before we get to our next question, we'll take a quick commercial break. Purdue has always been on the leading edge of innovation. It's one small step for man. You see, being a Boilermaker takes something special. Greatness is what we can achieve. Hard working is what we are. It's what we've always been, and it will lead to greatness once more. Let's play football. One in five teens in Indiana has abused prescription drugs. While many people use prescription drugs to help them feel better or manage a chronic illness, there is a potential for anyone at any age to abuse prescription drugs. Here are three simple steps you can take to help reduce your family's risk of prescription drug abuse. Store prescription drugs in a secure location, such as a medicine cabinet or locked drawer. Monitor medication use and talk about the dangers of prescription drugs with those in your family. Do not share medication with others or take more medication than prescribed. Dispose of unwanted or expired prescription drugs at designated take-back locations in your community. Do not pour medications down the sink or flush them down the toilet. These three steps can help prevent prescription drug abuse in your home and keep your family safe and healthy.
Welcome back to Ask a Professor. Let's get the next question. I was wondering, what do you think about the new building for like the library, compiling them all together and just having one instead of individual libraries for the um, different subjects? So it sounds like this question is maybe about the Active Learning Center. Do not know. Possibly. So we have a new building on campus, the, uh, the WALK, the Active mm -hmm. Learning Center. Yes. And it is a library's building. Have oh. you been there yet? Uh, where is the library? Well, we have a lot of libraries. OK. John's new this year. New. We have That's a lot nice. of libraries. And the undergraduate library is completely underground. We could get there from here. It would just be a tunnel, I think. Mm -hmm. And Does our, our library for, I mean, that, that, uh, it's that, handy in the winter. Okay. Good. Yeah. The library we use the most is probably the Hissy Library. I had to explain to my students today why it's called the Hissy Library when nothing <laughs> else on campus is Hissy. Do they know so what a, a Hissy little bit of history. is? <laughs> we didn't even go there. No, okay. Well, I'll just say it. <laughs> and you and I have Kentucky roots. We, we may true. know more what That's Hissy chips are. Uh, yeah, so the, the Active Learning Center is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I think that's great. There's mm -hmm. staff there all the time. And I have heard stories of people who come into campus in the wee hours or Sunday morning, and it's full of students that oh, wow. are studying and working. So I think that's great. But I, I don't think, uh, I hate to contradict our questioner, but I don't think it consolidated all the libraries. I don't think so either. That's why I was a little confused. Well, yeah. maybe there ought to be like a passive learning center as well. If there's an active one, we had a, you know, I'm new on campus. Maybe I can come up with some ideas like that to help you folks. Yeah. Out. Yeah, I hope it doesn't mean that all the rest of our buildings are actually passive learning centers. But it does have a lot of classrooms that provide different ways for students to learn, have different kinds of seating, different kinds of technology. So I think it's a good thing. I'm glad students are using it. I have taken my kids there to check it out. Oh. I have an 11-year-old and a 17-year-old, 16-year-old, oh. uh, not quite. And they like the spinny chairs. Have you seen the spinny chairs? I have not. I really don't leave fearing that much because yeah. you need to get out more Jane. I do. <laughs> That's why, what my students tell me too. Why do the chairs spin? Is that some kind of educational pedantic style here that That's I don't question. know about? I don't know but apparently they're comfortable and you can look look up. And, yeah. Like okay. that? Okay. They're, they're like cylinders. Okay. You, you need to yeah go check it out. I should. I could right. have pretty fun. Be mm -hmm. fun. I'd mm -hmm. love to do that for a mm -hmm. semester. It's also very steampunk. Like they have pieces of the old power plant that used to be there. Oh, that would be cool. On the walls, and yeah, it's interesting. I play trivia with one of the people that designed it. That's applicable, right? Okay. Absolutely. Okay, so let's hear from another question on campus. I think this one's from a student. So I want to be a professor too. And I know that you're one, so I was wondering what steps you took to be one, like from an undergrad level, and uh, what inspired you to be a professor? I'll start on this one because sure. I took a very traditional path, and I think Jane, for example, took a less traditional path, and neither of us lived in the in the woods as a hermit for no, five years. So <laughs> you've got a different group here. But I, my dad was a communication professor. And so I saw what that was like, and I think the thing that I liked the most about his job when I was growing up was that he got a fresh start every semester. Mm -hmm. You know, new group of students, new group of classes, uh, things to be excited about, and I, I really like that idea of that, that kind of constant restarting and renewing and doing things a little bit better the next time. So uh, I went to undergrad, I majored in speech communication, and then decided to just keep going got my master's degree and my PhD. Generally, it takes a lot of time in school if you want to be a professor. And so I finished up and got the job here, and that's where I've been. So mine is kind of boring, just straight through school, into the job. But Jane, you took a very different path. I took a very different path. My undergraduate major was journalism. Uh, I left undergrad and went to work for the Associated Press for about 17 years, like I said. I loved it, exciting, you know, 14-hour days, traveling here, traveling there. Um, then it started to wear on me a little bit. The phone calls in the middle of the night weren't quite as exciting. Um, so I was looking for a career change. And I've always liked the ideal of teaching. I thought it would be super interesting to be able to share my passion with students. And so I went back to graduate school. And then I came here to Purdue 
and I was right. I absolutely love teaching. I love working with the students. It's super fantastic. Um, and you're right, every semester is something new. Every semester I learn something new. Um, it's just a, an absolutely great career. So uh, you could, uh, mine came more from professional back into academia as opposed to straight through academia. Yeah, John, how about you? I think that's admirable because we need more professors on, uh, on campuses. I've, I've been affiliated with a number of campuses who really have a passion for teaching and are able to uh, articulate that. So I think that's great. Uh, one thing you'll have to do if you're in public relations uh, and, and become a professor is get a doctorate, which does take a long time, and then take a, a significant cut in pay. On the other hand, a uh, very rewarding profession because you get to be a mentor. You get to see some very uh, ambitious and bright students succeed, and I'm still in contact, as I'm sure you are, with many of them. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things is when they let me know what they're doing mm -hmm. and how they're doing. Yeah. Or Yep. When they sell me wallflowers at the mall. <laughs> Recruit you to be on television shows. Recruit me to be on TV shows, yes. Yeah. Kind of thing. All right, we'll be right back, but first, a quick commercial break. So the Brian Lim School of Communication has a long tradition as a department of communication originally, so well over a hundred year tradition. Uh, there has been communication here and the teaching of speech and organizational communication and other things for decades. We have a very vibrant, I think, curriculum um, for our students in five different areas of communication. It's everything from uh, human relations and you know communication about relationships to public relations to uh, communication within organizations to video production. I think we attract really a variety of students who are interested in learning about communication skills, but then also being able to use those skills in a variety of settings. Students have a lot of chances to get real, practical, applied experience, hands-on learning. The classes that I've taken have definitely helped me grow in the career that I want, and I could not imagine taking any of these classes anywhere else. I think. A great part of our curriculum is when we have alumni who come back to classes and talk to students. The networking is incredible through this program. We're all over the nation and even all over the world. Um, I've actually had an internship where a Purdue grad was working there full time and it was at Warner Brothers Studios. I think when, when people hear about Purdue University, their first thoughts are probably engineering and astronauts. I'd like for students who aren't necessarily interested in being astronauts or engineers to also think about Purdue but in terms of the Brian Lamb School of Communication. Also very excited to see what my future holds because of Purdue, and I know I'm fully prepared because of the Brian Lamb School. Welcome back. Let's take another question. My question is, how much time, hours a week, would you spend on homework for your undergrad major? How much time, when we were undergrads, did we oh. spend, I think that's the question, did we spend on homework? John, <laughs> how much time did you spend as an undergrad? A lot, just because as a high school student, I think I read one book, and uh, the rest were Cliff's Notes, and it wasn't until my sophomore year as an English major, I started to read, and I became a voracious reader, and I read everything. And so, the personally, the homework, I took a lot of English classes, and I just enjoyed reading a whole lot. Okay. Jane, how, what was your workload like as an undergrad? It was a lot, because as you're waiting in line for Kentucky basketball tickets, because you had to wait in line sometimes a day and a half, I had a lot of time to do homework. <laughs> I was, I had a lot of reading. I, I double majored actually in English too, and so I, I, oh, I remember yeah. we had the, I took uh, Shakespeare, the Shakespeare tragedy class and the comedy class, and it was a lot to read to I keep was, up with I that. I was going to so. double major until I got to waiting for Godot, and then I said I'm not majoring you'll, in English you'll, you'll you'll wait. anymore. <laughs> you know, we, we have a colleague, I heard the story about one of our colleagues that they went to see Waiting for Godot, uh -huh. and it got to intermission. Uh -huh. And one part of the couple didn't know how it ended and said, when is Godot going to show up? <laughs> and the other person was like, that's, Good spoil, I don't want to spoil it for you, but yeah. told, told how it was going to end. And, and the first person said, well, then let's just go. And, and they did. So, yeah, no, I don't remember having, I, we had to read Company. 
uh, which I think is um, read what? Not really right. company. Yeah. Well, we company. took I took a study abroad to London this summer. We went over to Paris for the weekend, and we went to some cemeteries. And I went to Samuel. You Beckett's. like to say stuff like that? Uh, I went to Paris. For yes, the weekend, I went to right? Paris for the weekend, um, and we went to Samuel Beckett's grave. And I yeah. told him that I'm sorry, Samuel Beckett, but I just did not like waiting for Godot. Yeah, I'm sure he was crushed. It's okay. Wherever he is. But if I had to estimate, to get back to our question, oh. if I had to estimate, I'd say I probably spent maybe five hours, six hours a week on homework. Mm -hmm. Probably more when it was time to work on papers and projects. True, 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 true. Yeah. All right, let's do one more question before we go back to commercial. Um, I was just wondering if you would ever go to campus bars with your students <laughs> and why or why not? Would you ever go to campus bars with your students? Why or why not? I'll start. I, I don't really go to campus bars and didn't really when I was a college student, so that's why I wouldn't now. Jane, how about you? I would not. Love my students, but I'm just not going to go have a drink with them. I don't go to campus bars. I go to sports bars and watch sports, and I might see them there and say hi, but that's as kind of far as it, it's ever going to get. John, what's your answer? The rumor that I was dancing naked on a table at one of the bars down here is untrue. The fact is uh, I don't do that because uh, I learned one of my classes, I took at another, I taught at another school. The students came in, the first thing they said was, you're taking over for this other professor. It was a grad class, and they said, we always meet at a, a local bar. And I said, no, we don't. And I think that did affect my uh, evaluations, but I think, I don't think you should, really. Yeah. But Jane, I understand that you have a tradition, if I, if I can go off script a little bit, of meeting in a sports bar with former student once a year. Oh, once a year, yes. Yeah. Well, um, special okay. occasion. Yes, yes. That's all right. special occasion during March Madness. Yeah. Um, I, from Thursday at 8 a.m., I am there till it closes Thursday night, Friday at 8 a.m. till it closes Friday night, Saturday, Sunday, and I have a former graduate student. And undergrad, Matt. Yeah. He started here as oh, an undergrad. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Went he all the way through. In, and we sit there for four days, and we watch college basketball, and lots of people join us, uh, colleagues, and, and, and actually some other former graduate students join us. Right. But, uh, yeah, that's, everybody knows where I am on the, the March Madness time. But that's not exactly the same thing. It's not the same thing as going question. to Harry's. and. It's not. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not wooing. Woo! So, in general... Our answer is no. no. We really don't go out drinking with our mm. undergraduate students. I vote no. no. And of course, most of our undergraduate students are not legally able to this do that in any way, which yeah. is true. also. Although, when you do teach study abroad, oh, look at her name dropping again. Yeah, that's in true. London, my <laughs> students um, in Siena, which I'm doing this summer, and Josh is doing London, uh, you don't have to be true. 21. True. So, there is the pub culture there is something totally different. It is, it is quite different. Yes. But I think we'll get back to some more questions after this commercial break. One in five teens in Indiana has abused prescription drugs. While many people use prescription drugs to help them feel better or manage a chronic illness, there is a potential for anyone at any age to abuse prescription drugs. Here are three simple steps you can take to help reduce your family's risk of prescription drug abuse. Store prescription drugs in a secure location, such as a medicine cabinet or locked drawer. Monitor medication use and talk about the dangers of prescription drugs with those in your family. Do not share medication with others or take more medication than prescribed. Dispose of unwanted or expired prescription drugs at designated take-back locations in your community. Do not pour medications down the sink or flush them down the toilet. These three steps can help prevent prescription drug abuse in your home and keep your family safe and healthy. Welcome back. It's time for our final question mm -hmm. on this episode. What is one thing you wish your students knew about you? Okay. One thing that we wish our students knew about us. One thing. Let, let me break this. I'm going to take some professorial discretion here. Let's break this into two. Let's, let's make it one thing that we wish our students knew about us that we're proud of. Uh -huh. 
And then one thing that we wish our students knew about us, um, maybe that's fun or that makes us seem more like a regular person. How about that? John, why don't, you, why don't you start with this? What's something you're proud of that you wish your students knew? Regular person. Okay, proud or of. Regular. Let me see. I survived three years as a freelance writer, which I, I, you know mm -hmm. is a rough business to be a word merchant, to be able to uh, sell magazine articles, etc. Now, I did not survive well. Rama noodles for me was a, a tremendous treat, but nonetheless, that it, it growed me up proper when I was younger that I took some time to, to freelance, so, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> but you're proud that you survived it. Yeah. Survived it. Jane, how about you? What's something you're proud of? So when I first started in this industry, uh, I was one of the few female sports writers. Me and Leslie Visser were the only two people at my first uh, basketball NCAA Final Four national championship. I was the first woman that was in the Churchill Downs, allowed in the Churchill Downs, uh, jockey room. Um, so I've had a lot of fights and I think that um, I like to think that I've helped some of my female students be able to have the careers that they want to in mass communication. They really don't know it. I don't talk about it a lot but there's a lot of people that came before and I'd like to think that maybe I was a teeny teeny part of that. Was there any um, fallout when you went into the locker room? Did you get harassed? Actually I was first denied. Because first denied? How did you react? I was stunned. And the guy said, I can't let you in there. There's a bunch of little naked men running around in there, and you've got no business seeing that. Leprechauns. Yeah. And I was just kind of stunned, and I had to immediately call for Churchill Downs security. And by the time I got in there, uh, I'd lost about 10, 15 good minutes. Yeah. So. Did you, were you at the trailblazer there after that? Did, did uh, reporters they, they had, manage they had to, to make get an in adjustment. whoever they Just were? like when I started covering, uh, you know, when we, I first started covering men's basketball, we couldn't go in the locker room. Mm -hmm. So because more and more females started covering sports, they had to allow us in the locker room or bring people out sooner. They started having to make changes. Right. Cool. Yep. That's good. So I, I have always read the Wall Street Journal. I, I really enjoy the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal. It, it has much broader coverage than most people think it does. And I don't know, several years ago, I decided that it would be really cool if I could be in the Wall Street Journal. Oh, cool. And so... I, I wrote some op-eds about things that I did research on, and uh, a few years ago, one of them got published. So, you know, I've published academic stuff that a handful of people yeah. maybe have read or been forced to read <laughs> by their graduate school professors. Yeah. Um, but this was something where it was right there in this paper that has a big circulation, and people that I hadn't seen in years emailed me, and they had seen it. And um, so I was really proud of that. That was That's pretty that cool. Was pretty cool. What was your topic? Uh, corporate stadium names. Hmm. Oh, I think it was something. Well, I think it was cheering for teams that don't sell their home names or something. It was cleverer than that. I Papa John's exactly. Stadium. Uh, so that do, yeah, I don't know this. Is our stadium named after a corporation here? No, no. not at Purdue. Okay, no. well, we got to figure out one right now <laughs> before we. Well, I, I, I mean, I think Value City Arena for the Buckeyes is kind of. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of embarrassing. That's pretty uh, bad. Okay. Kmart. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm proud of that. Okay, so things we're proud of. Mm -hmm. Now, how about something that's a little bit more fun? John, what's something you wish students knew about you that's fun? Maybe a quirk, a hobby, an accomplishment. What's something that's fun? Hmm. I see a lot of my students over at the Co-Rec. And what I found out as I've gotten older is I need to work out. So um, it, it's fun to see them, and, and they're very polite. They don't, you know, and there's a place for professors where they can hide and work out there too. Mm -hmm. I don't do that too much, but they only go, "Hey, I, I know that guy. He's he's about to bench press the bar, which is 45 pounds, and I'm going to do that soon with an EMT and a couple of spotters. So get ready for that. I'll be there bench pressing the bar. Expect my students to cheer me on. All right, Jane, what's yours? Well, I'll go with speaking to the co because, frankly, if you've ever been in one of my classes, you know that I will go off on any topic. You know everything about me, from what I bowled to what the dog did on the kitchen floor this morning. So my students will really know everything about me. But speaking of the co this is something I do tell at the when we get introduced to new graduate students. 
um, something funny that happened to me. It was Mitch Daniels when he was just had been named the new president of Purdue University. And I was in the co-rec and I was leaving. I just worked out and I had on my Kentucky sweatshirt. Um, and he was coming in and the new president of Purdue, our former governor says, Kentucky, Kentucky, what are you doing with that on? And I had a Purdue shirt on underneath it. And I was gonna be, oh, God, it's okay. I bleed blue, but I boil her up. Oh, whoops. And I pulled up both of the shirts and I flashed our new president. <laughs> he flashed, he flashed as the president. This is great. Then I stupidly pulled the shirt down. So he was like, oh, you're in the school of communication. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm sure my department heads love that. But that's, that's my story that students might not know as I have flashed the university's president. <laughs> Yeah, I can't match that. Whoa, no. Uh, I Nor would I want to. <sighs> but um, He was really cool about it. His yeah, face never good. changed. Well, so. he's a, I mean, he, he has a political background. He's diplomatic. I, I, well, if I were a student, I'd want to know, what is your collection of bow ties? What's your favorite? And why are you a bow tie guy? So I don't know how many bow ties I have. Probably about 200, that's my estimate. Whoa. Um, it's more than a dozen. And a few years ago, I got to the point where I decided I would not duplicate one during a semester, just because otherwise I'm not going to get to all of them. So I do have a little system to make sure I don't rewear one in a semester. Okay, that's super cool. I don't, I know that. I don't have a favorite. <laughs> I like a lot of them. Um, and I started wearing them. I asked, I had a professor at Ohio University who wore bow ties. And I asked him about it one day, like, why do you do that? And how do you tie a bow tie? And I don't know why. And I'm, I'm, this is not true of me. He had a spare bow tie in his office, a practice <laughs> bow tie. Who doesn't? Right. <laughs> this was Paul Nelson. He was dean of the School of Communication. And before I knew it, he had me standing next to him in front of a mirror. Oh, wow. And, 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 and uh, teaching me how to tie the bow tie. And so... At first, I would just wear, wear a tie occasionally, if it was a special occasion okay. or something. And my uh, then girlfriend, eventually wife, she was not sure what to think about that at the time. But I got a little bit more proficient, and she got a little bit more accustomed to the stairs. <laughs> and it's still kind of funny, because I get used to, to wearing a tie on campus yeah. a lot. And there are a few of us on campus that wear bow ties. And so walking across campus, I get some strange looks, but it's not, it's not too bad. Um, but then if we're somewhere else, like if we go to a restaurant or something, after church maybe, and I'm wearing the bow tie, yeah. sometimes I'm like, why are people staring at me? And then I, oh, that's right, it's because obvious reason. Well, you can so. make up other reasons. I would use you know, my unbelievable intellect, you know, but the bow tie right. probably is unique because it's not yeah. pervasive. We you know, wouldn't wear a lot of them. Do you now. keep one in your drawer now in case I someone don't. asks you about <laughs> No, bow I don't, ties? but I do have a bow tie story about bow ties oh, okay. here at Purdue. So David Bodai, who's our resident gold medalist yep. here in West Lafayette. Who just announced he was going to buy again. Oh, I, I yeah, heard that's that. It's you know. exciting. He's a realtor now, I think. I'll give a little oh, plug for I have an embarrassing story about David, David. Bodai, anyway, too. Anyway, he, there was going to be a family portrait, and he thought it would, or maybe his wife thought it would be cool for him to wear a bow tie. Yeah. And so he asked me if he could borrow one. Absolutely. So I brought him a couple, and he picked one out. And he came back the next week. I said, how did it go? He said it, it didn't happen. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, he goes, I watched some YouTube videos. And he said, I worked on it. And we, we'd spent like 45 minutes and could not get it tied. Oh and so I thought, here is a gold medalist. And there is something I can do that involves dexterity. Thank you don't you like, like clip-ons? I mean, I'm a clip-on guy. Mm -hmm. No, you, they're, they're, they're real. They're real. they got to be myself. real. That's Jane, awesome. what, what do you have in your office that you're hiding beside the backup uh, Kentucky shirt. Probably just like a junk drawer of food. Yeah. Food. <laughs> food. Okay. Nothing food. exciting. Nope. Nothing like a. Smart. Do you have anything hidden in your office? <laughs> hmm. No, pretty much. I just got in the office, so yeah. it's rather barren. It would take me probably six months to make it a big mess. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Check back. Oh, I've had plenty of time to make mine a big mess. Yeah. Check back. I have a little tiny Christmas tree that's in a drawer. Mm -hmm. oh. Pull it out in November, plug it into a battery. That's, that's a little cool. thing I've got hiding in my office. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Jane. Thank you, John, for coming in tonight to be part of this episode and answer some of these questions.
My name is Josh Boyd. I invite you to turn in, tune in next week for another episode of Ask a Professor. Until next time.